Hello, everybody. This is Whitfield Harrington, and I am back with another video giving a book review for the month as we have started doing a book recommendation for the month. Um, and I'm going to start off by just asking a question, and you probably have seen by the title. Why do we have so many different Bible versions? You know, and that's probably a question that's lingering in the mind of a lot of people. Is there really a big difference in these different Bible versions? And I think you're going to be really surprised if you happen to read the book that we're recommending this month that you read. So there is a book um, called New Age Bible Versions, an exhaustive documentation exposing the message, men, and manuscripts moving mankind to the Antichrist one world religion. Now, I'm going to show you just a copy of this particular book so that if you want to grab a copy, you can. It is a very, very, very um, well-researched, well-put-together, and as you can see, quite a big book, all right? Um, but it can be found on Amazon. I have also seen that, um, that some libraries have a PDF version of the older version of this. That's what was an older version of this book um, that you may find very useful. Now, when you think about the different versions of the Bible, one of the things that you have to think about is some of the most common scriptures that are known when it comes to the Bible. And you think about scriptures that you were taught as a child, scriptures that you may have learned over the years that are very common to you. And then if you take those scriptures and you begin to go through different versions of the Bible, you will notice that there is a big difference in many of the versions of the Bible. Well, one of the things that you need to be able to research like the author did is you need a tool. And I want to show you a tool that I like to use or website that I like to use to help give me um, some better insight and, and a quicker way of researching the Bible. It's a particular website called blueletterbible.com or, or you can type in blb.com. They also have pretty much all of this on an app as well. And it is, a, it is an awesome website that when it comes to researching Bibles, it has a very good search engine. However, you must you know, be very meticulous about how you spell things and word things because it won't kind of catch things and correct them for you. Um, that's probably one of the only cons I have with this particular site. Well, let's just think for a moment. When the author of this particular book is saying that the new age or many of the new Bibles that are emerging in this generation. Um, and the author points out the NIV, the ESV, the NKJV, referring to the New International Version of the Bible, King James Version of the Bible, um, and so and so on. So when we see that the author is pointing these particular um, Bibles out, I think it's worth noting that you should be able to take certain scriptures from one particular version of the Bible and then compare it to the other. And one of the things that um, is probably not well known is a lot of the Bibles, the new versions of the Bible, they have copyright protections, meaning you can't quote them um, without first getting their permission. You can't republish that Bible version without first getting their permission. But the King James version of the Bible is in what is called public domain. Um, it means the copyrights rest with the throne of England. It's been passed down for generations and it's free for the general public worldwide to use it as they desire. All right. So that's one thing that a lot of the, the Bibles that are coming along, they're being pushed out by publishers. And the author goes into dealing with who are the publishers, and you would be shocked to hear that some of the same people who are publishing Bibles are some of the same people who were publishing the Satanic Bible. So it, it's, it's real deep. 
And I, I highly recommend this book for anyone that's in leadership and ministry to read it. All right. Um, please don't go down into the comment section and start defending your version of the Bible just yet. All right. I let the, let the facts speak for themselves. If you take the book and you read the book and you come to your own conclusions on it, um, on how you want to go about um, processing this. But I can say this, that the Lord has been on me about doing this. Literally, I was intending to do this sometime later on, but the Lord has been on me to really, really, really go ahead and talk about this particular book and how many of the different versions of the Bible are not as pure as we think they are. And so I'm going to go back quickly to this little um, screen here on the Blue Letter Bible. And let's talk about one particular passage or one scripture out of the Bible that I think we all know, if, especially if you've been in church long enough. If you're not, well, just listen. There's a scripture, um, Philippians 4 and 13. And let's just go there so you can read it and make certain that we got everything correct. So you go to here to quick navigation, and then you find Philippians. Everything is abbreviated. Chapter 4. And we're going to scroll down to verse 13. Now, I'm doing this for a reason because I want you to see this. I could have did a PowerPoint presentation, but some things would have been missed. So I had to do it this way. Philippians 4 and 13, a very well-known scripture from the Bible, says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthen me. Very simple. Um, we as children who grew up in church and many adults, we know that scripture is a very common scripture. But what happens when you take that scripture and you begin to cross-reference it in different versions of the Bible? So we can go up here and we can actually change the version of the Bible real quick. So we can go here, and if you just kind of let it hover over, it'll tell you which version of the Bible it is. It's the King James Version of the Bible. So um, as we take a look at this King James Version of the Bible, the new King James Version of the Bible, Philippians 4 and 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, this is the reason why I wanted to do this from this website. Because if you don't look at that real, real close, you won't see that footnote. What is a footnote? It's something that's added to a word that basically calls into question or gives an explanation for the word that's there. Behind the word Christ here is a footnote. See that little F-E-N in the parentheses? It has a explanation in the footnote said text reads him who. So what they're saying is that there were some different manuscripts that don't use the word Christ, but rather it uses the word him. Hmm. Now they kept the word Christ in their version, but they added a footnote. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, it'll show you. The NU text reads him who. Now, let me explain to you what's happening. here. The Bible originally was not written in English. It had to be translated into English. And so they had to use ancient texts from the writers. And they would have to um, translate those texts into English. So over the years, many manuscripts started popping up of this particular version or this particular chapter of the Bible, or this particular book of the Bible. And so now what's happening is a lot of the new age Bibles, they are grabbing different manuscripts, ancient texts, and they're getting the ones that say something different than the original King James Version of the Bible. Now, so let's just take this into account that they decided to sell us, to share with us that, you know, there are some new text that doesn't say Christ, all right? And we know the importance of Christ, the word Christ, Jesus Christ. It has a very strong significance as it relates to the body of Christ. And when you think about the things um, that we may be learning as a new child in God, 
a new birth, a new baby in Christ. We got to pause and think for a moment. If we start taking words here out and words there out, it can slightly change the meaning a little. So, but the New King James Version kept it in there. So let's see what the New Living Translation decided to do at verse 13. They said the same thing. For well, I can do everything through Christ. Footnote, <laughs> through the one is what their footnote says, who gives me strength. All right, let's change again. Let's get to the NIV. And you get down to verse 13. It says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, notice that they've clearly just decided to take the word Christ out. Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, they just decided to take it out. Now, who benefits from this scripture being changed? Do a believer, a person who has just come to the Lord, does it make it easier for them to understand now that, or does it kind of smooth the message out to where now him can mean a lot of different individuals? All right. So this is what's happening. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig a little deeper into this, because when you think about the name Christ, there are many names that are ascribed to the Lord Jesus, all right? And when you think about the arch enemy of Christ, which is Satan himself, a lot of people don't know the origin of Satan was he was an angel. He was an angel. The devil was an angel in heaven who led a rebellion with about a third of the angels at that time, and they were kicked out of heaven. And they were sent to a place called hell. God created hell for the angels that rebelled against him. And the original name of the devil is actually in the Bible. His name is Lucifer. And it's only found one time in the Bible. And this is what I have noticed that if you want to check a Bible real quick to see if it's got a lot of things that's going to be missing, there's one particular scripture I recommend you go to. That's Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14 and, and verse 12 is where it mentions the name Lucifer. It reads... How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Here, it's asking the question, how in the world, Lucifer, which is the name of this fallen angel who happens to be the devil now, how did you get into this predicament? All right. Then verse 13 says, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit up on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So this is Lucifer in the beginning talking about how he's going to promote himself and be just like God. In fact, to be bigger than God. And then the Bible says, yet thou shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So this is how he failed. He wanted to exalt himself above God. Now, it's important for us to know, in my opinion, how we all got into this situation. And it's this guy's fault, to be honest, Lucifer. He started the rebellion in heaven. He led Adam and Eve into a lifestyle of sin, of disobeying God, and now we have all the troubles of the world and we still have to deal with the devil and his minions. So I think it's important to know his origin, person. Well, what, what do you think the other translations of the Bible think? Do you think they think it's important for you to know his original name? Well, let's see. We can quickly change. Let's go to the New King James Version.
Come on, New King James Version coming up. There we go. And go down to verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Notice they have a footnote behind that word. And this is what the author points out consistently throughout this book, the things that they put footnotes on. And this footnote says, literally, it means day star. So in other words, it should have read day star, not Lucifer. You don't need to know, you know, don't get confused by the word Lucifer. Well, it means day star. All right. So if we go to the next version, which is the New Living Translation version, scroll down to verse 12, what do we get? How are you fallen from heaven, O shining star? See, they took his name out. Now, that name is only mentioned one time in the King James Version of the Bible. So you're not going to find it anywhere else in the Bible. And they call him, um, O shining star, son of the morning, you have been thrown down to the earth. You who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's, God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heaven and be like the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead. Notice they said it different. That the King James Version says that you will be brought down to hell. But they say you will be brought down to the place of the dead. Well, let's think for a moment. If this is what happened in the beginning, who's dead? If this was what happened in the beginning of time, before Adam and Eve had died, then where is the dead? So he was cast down in a form of punishment to hell. But the thing about a lot of these new translations, and the author points this out in, in ways, so, so many ways that I can't even cover all, that instead of giving clarity, it creates ambiguity means it, it can almost confuse you. Now, this Bible says that, that you will be brought down to the place of the dead, all right? Now, if if it if we stick with what's written in the King James Version and it says be brought down to, to hell, it's, in my opinion, a little easier to comprehend the concept of hell because most people in the world have a concept of hell, even children have a concept of hell. But here we see now that there's a changing that's eliminating a lot of words. I mean, if we just pause for a moment and we decided to do a word search, for an example, let's go back to the King James Version of the Bible. And we'll come back to Isaiah in just a second. If we decide to do a word search on the word hell, just the word hell, you will see that it's mentioned 54 times in the King James Version of the Bible. All right? The word hell. If you go to the New King James Version of the Bible and do the same search, what happens? The word hell is only mentioned 32 times. So they've, only, they've gone back and decided, well, we're going to use it only 32 times instead of the 54 times. And if you continue to go on to the New Living Translation, they only use the word hell 17 times. See how they're, they're, they're taking certain words out, and then they're even putting footnotes behind them, stating that, you know, it really means something else. It's not really hell, but they give it another name. And, and, and it may not seem important, but they, they, they all kind of have the same, you know, way of making things um, give, give you the same meaning. Uh, and, and we have to call that into question, all right? In the NIV, we see that it's only mentioned 13 times. But if we st stayed with the NIV and we went back to our original scripture, which is something I wanted to point out to you, they make a statement in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 that is pretty much blasphemous. Pretty much blasphemous. I'm going to ask you a question for my Bible scholars who know the Bible well enough. Um, there's a scripture 
that gives Jesus a particular name. And it's the last book of the Bible, which is the book of Revelations, chapter 22, and verse 16. So let me go to the King James Version of this. All right. Here is Jesus talking in the last chapter of the Bible after it's been completed. And the testimony has been given to John. Verse 16, Jesus said, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So if I ask you a question, who is the morning star? Based off of what you see here in Revelations 22 and 16, you can conclude that Jesus is the morning star because he said that I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. But if you take this particular two words, morning star, I'm going to copy and paste it up here. And do a search throughout the entire King James Version of the Bible. What happens? You see morning star only used two times in Revelations 2 and 28 and Revelations 22 and 16. So Jesus is saying that he is the morning star. But what happens when you do a search for this in the NIV version of the Bible? Those exact words now pop up four times. Morning star. But they happen to also be in the exact same place that we started. Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14 and 12. How are you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to the earth. You once laid low the nations. So now here they're saying, where the other versions of the Bible were saying, Lucifer fell from heaven. But they're saying the morning star fell from heaven. And if you cross-reference this in their Bible with Revelation 22 and 16, it's almost as if they're saying that Jesus was the one that was kicked out of it. So they've taken the word Lucifer out. Then they've inserted morning star. And now it sounds like that Jesus got kicked out of it. So these are some of the things that are happening in these new versions of the Bible. I'm going to dig a little deeper into this because a lot of people don't understand how uh, the total experience of the Christian life is supposed to end. And that's one of the things about deception. Um, you know, some years ago, I was doing a study and I began to notice that at the beginning of the church, when the apostles were active and were building the church, the devil was busy trying to destroy it, all right? But the more he tried to destroy it, the more it growed. So he revised his strategy away from outright destroying them to rather deceiving them. Because there's a difference in an operation to destroy. Because if something is out to destroy you, you can figure out what's happening and you can make the adjustments to keep it from destroying you, all right, as it relates to the walk with the Lord. Um, but if something is designed to deceive, the deception from a religious perspective, it truly doesn't work until the person is dead. And if a person has been deceived and they died, then they can't make the corrections that were necessary to stop them from the destruction that they're going to face after they've been deceived and died. 
So the enemy begins to use strategies of deception to deceive the nations. And so what we see here now is there is a, a movement of a lot of different Bibles, and I'm just barely touching the surface on this subject. Um, this particular book, it goes deep into breaking down how this deception is taking fold. And I think it's very important. I'm going to show the book again. It's very important to understand what is happening here. When it comes to deception, it's a matter of understanding how does all this play out? How does everyone who's going to heaven get to heaven? And how did everyone who ended up in hell ended up there? And I think that's why the word of God, the Bible exists, is to help bring clarity to questions such as that. Um, and I think it's worth noting that when you begin to research the Bible, there are certain passages in the Bible that share with you exactly how things are supposed to play out. Um, for example, I'm going to ask a very simple question and give you a very detailed answer. What is the one thing that is required to enter heaven? Now, this is not to make you feel like you're right or wrong. You probably would say, well, you got to accept Christ. Yes, but that's not the answer I'm looking for. Or you got to live right. Yes, but that's not the answer I'm looking for. There is one particular thing that you must have in your possession or in your life. Or in your favor, I should say, when you leave this world, if you want to enter heaven. And that can be found in the book of Revelations chapter 20. Revelations chapter 20, and I'm going to put that up here so you can see it. Revelations chapter 20, beginning at verse, verse 11, we'll start there. Here, the apostle John is telling us that he saw the judgment or the judgment day, as we grow to know it. And he talks about the great white throne judgment. And uh, I'll just talk on that briefly. There's a difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. But I won't go too deeply into that right now because that's not the main point. And I'm going to read so that you would know the one thing you must have in your advantage on that day when you stand before God to get into heaven. So here it is. Judgment day is playing out. And John says, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heaven fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before God and the books were open. So he's saying, I see everybody, the dead, great and small. They're standing before God. And he said there were books open, just books everywhere being open. And he says another book was open, which is the book of life. He's, out of all of the books there, he only names one book, which is the book of life. So pay very close attention to that. Then he says the dead were judged according to to what they had done as recorded in the books. Now, Lord help me, I'm reading from the wrong version. Let me go back. <laughs> I apologize. Let me go back to the King James Version. I, I've been reading this too long. I know that wasn't it. All right. So here he goes. Let's start over. Revelations chapter 20, verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and their place was found, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Listen to me. You have a book. I have a book. Every person on the face of the earth has a book with their name on it. That when you stand before God, the book of your life is going to be open. Every word that you have said, every deed that you have done, your entire life has been documented 
in that book. And this is what you will be judged from. And as you can see, the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, why is this so important? Because if you're going to judge somebody, you have to have evidence, right? It's only fair for God to judge us and that there's not evidence presented. So your whole life will be presented as evidence. There are certain things that God has forgiven you for that would be stricken from the record or removed from the book. As he forgives, he removes it from the book. All right. Um, so here it is. Everybody has been judged out of their particular book. And there's one primary book that's open that's been named, which is the book of life. Verse 20 says, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death in hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they would judge every man according to their works. Now, notice it said the sea gave up the dead that was in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Now, let me explain this to you. So, because most people don't understand the concept of hell. Hell is like the local county jail for the spirit world. All right. When a person gets arrested here in Chicago, more than likely they're going to end up in Cook County Jail. All right. And you can be held in Cook County Jail until you stand trial. And then if you're found guilty, you're sent to prison, sent to a prison somewhere. When it comes to hell, hell is like that holding place for the dead who are not in Christ. Then it says here, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the sack of death. So what's now the final place or like the, the prison, the penitentiary, hell is cast into the lake of fire. So that's kind of like the final place or the sack of death for those individuals who are in hell. And then verse 15, which is the question that I was asking, what is the one thing that you need to ensure that you end up in heaven? It says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the one thing that you need to make certain that you have in your favor is that your name is written in the book of life. Because when you stand before God, a lot of books are going to be open. One particular book is going to be open called the Book of Life, and they're going to look for your name in that book. If your name is in that book, then you enter heaven. If your name is not in that book, then the Bible clearly states that all those individuals whose names are not written in that book will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, this is the simplest way I know to explain to you the concept of why Jesus died for us, all right? But if you take this same passage of Scripture and you begin to look at it from different versions of the Bible, and let me just jump ahead to the NIV since I was there already. Starting at verse 12 again, it, it goes a little differently. It says, and I saw a great white throne on, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heaven fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Now, notice there. They've changed standing before God to standing before the throne. See that? So this Bible makes you think that in the end of time that you're going to have to stand before a throne. But why would anybody want to remove God and stand for the throne there. Is it anybody on the throne? Or is it just a throne? All right? So these things matter. And so um, I don't want my opinion to get too loud here, but I want to just point you out to some of the things that are happening. And I encourage you, you know, to, to go deeper into this matter, getting this book. I have provided a link in the description of, of a, uh, it's an older version, but it's in a library somewhere that they've uh, made it available to read the older version of But the newer version has a lot of more information on it the way as well. Now, I'm not um, um, getting anything from you downloading or purchasing the book. I just want you to take a look at this for yourself. Uh, and if we keep reading, 
where he says, um, and standing before the throne and books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades. See that? They decided, let's take the word hell out. We need to make this much easier for people to understand. And let's insert the word Hades. Gave up the day that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You see, these things are being done deliberately. They're being done deliberately. And the author points out, you know, many of the people who are behind it and, and the, the design or the attempt is really to smooth out the religious experience of the Christian faith to where it can accommodate what's coming which is the Antichrist. I'm going to just put this back up here again and I'll uh, encourage you to read this book, all right? To read it. Um, you have someone in leadership, get them a copy of it. You don't have to read very, it's, a, it's 700 pages long. <laughs> you don't have to get very far in it before you can clearly see that something is happening. There's something happening as to why we have all these dip different Bible versions. And it's my desire that God will open all of our eyes to see what he wants us to see. So this is our bookly, a monthly, I should say, book suggestion for those of you who are following along with us. So I pray that this video has blessed you and I look forward to sharing more with you in the next video. God bless you.